November 30th. We begin our reading of the Bible in the Old Testament today. We'll be looking into the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 1 through 28. We'll uh, be reading about a vision of world history. Man views human kingdoms as valuable metals, but God sees them as vicious animals that fight and devour each other. Human history will culminate in a worldwide kingdom under a satanic world ruler, the Antichrist, who will defy God and eventually be defeated by God's Son. We'll read about a vision of heaven here in Daniel chapter 7. While the beasts are fighting on earth, God is holding court in heaven, and everything is under His control. Jesus Christ will one day establish a righteous kingdom that nobody will overthrow. And we'll also read about a vision of saints on earth. These saints are believers during the end times, just before the Lord returns to set up His kingdom. But what Daniel says about them has spiritual application to us, the believers of today. They are involved in a war and suffer persecution, but they will receive the kingdom and reign with Christ. This is all going to happen, and Daniel saw it and reveals it to you and me today. The Bible is relevant. When the course of world history depresses you, just look at the events from heaven's point of view. And with that, let's begin our reading today in the Old Testament. November 30th. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 28. Earlier, during the first year of King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he lay in his bed. He wrote the dream down, and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea, with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off, and it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground, like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. Then I saw a second beast, and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I heard a voice saying to it, Get up, devour many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four wings, like birds' wings on its back, and it had four heads. Great authority was given to this beast. Then in my vision that night I saw a fourth beast terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled what was left beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were wrenched out, roots and all, to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes, and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. I watched as thrones were put in place, and the Ancient One sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like whitest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire flowed from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him, and a hundred million stood to attend him. Then the court began its session, and the books were opened. I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed, and its body was destroyed by fire. As for the other three beasts, their authority was taken from them. But they were allowed to live for a while longer. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone who looked like a man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and royal power over all the nations of the world, so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled by all I had seen, 
and my visions terrified me. So I approached one of those standing beside the throne and asked him what it all meant. He explained it to me like this. These four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, the one so different from the others, and so terrifying. It devoured and crushed its victims, with iron teeth and bronze claws, and it trampled what was left beneath its feet. I also asked about the ten horns on the fourth beast's head and the little horn that came up afterward and destroyed three of the other horns. This was the horn that seemed greater than the others, and had human eyes, and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and was defeating them. Until the Ancient One came and judged in favor of the holy people of the Most High. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. Then he said to me, This fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings that will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and wear down the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. But then the court will pass judgment, and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. They will rule forever, and all rulers will serve and obey them. That was the end of the vision. I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts, and my face was pale with fear. But I kept these things to myself. November 30th And now as we turn our attention to the reading of the New Testament, we begin in a new book today, the book of 1 John. Here's an overview. The apostle wrote this letter to his dear little children, the phrase is used, by the way, nine times, little children, uh, to help them find assurance of personal salvation. When you are sure of your salvation, you can have fellowship with God and God's people. You can experience joy and have victory over sin. John also wrote to warn believers about false teachers. Both Peter and John were concerned about purity of doctrine in the church, and you and I should be concerned about that same thing today, too. Well, chapters 1 and 2 focus on fellowship and contrast saying and doing. It's easy to talk the Christian life, but God wants the walk, not just the talk. John emphasizes sonship in chapters 3 through 5. Uh, the phrase born of God is used several times there and gives three marks of the true child of God, doing God's will, loving the brethren, and believing the truth. God is light, and His children should walk in the light. God is love, and His children should walk in love. The Spirit is truth, and God's children should believe and obey the truth. Well, that's a basic overview of the book of 1 John. We'll be reading today in the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And here's what's going on there. God wants you to have a living fellowship with Him and His children in Jesus Christ. He has revealed what true life really is. Even though you cannot see Him and touch Him as the apostles did centuries ago, He can still be real to you as His Holy Spirit opens the Word to your heart. He wants you to have a joyful fellowship. It's not the fellowship of a slave with a master, but that of a child with a parent. God delights in His children and longs to share His love with them. When you are happy in the will of God, you are ready to live for Him and serve Him. He wants you to have an honest fellowship as well. This means walking in the light and dealing honestly with sin. Now, salvation is a matter of life or death, 
But fellowship is a matter of light or darkness. If you lie to God, to others, and to yourselves, you will lose your fellowship with God and your character. A godly character does not develop in the darkness. And with that, let's begin reading today in the book of 1 John in the New Testament. November 30th, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. The one who existed from the beginning is the one we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is Jesus Christ, the word of life. This one who is life from God was shown to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and announce to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was shown to us. We are telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy will be complete. This is the message He has given us to announce to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in Him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not living in the truth, but if we are living in the light of God's presence, just as Christ is, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from every sin. If we say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. Psalm 119, verse 153 through 176. One of the most difficult things in the life of faith is to be accused by Satan and ungodly people. Plead my cause, prayed the psalmist, and God defended him. When the enemy accuses you, let the word of God assure you, for the word is truth. If Satan tries to drag you into his court, rely on God for what to do and what to speak. Knowing the word of God and obeying it will bring joy to your heart, the kind of joy you would have if you found a buried treasure or inherited a fortune If material wealth is your goal, God's Word will not be a joy to you. But if you love the Word more than money, you will have eternal spiritual treasures. Along with joy, you'll experience love and peace and hope, treasures money cannot buy. If you put the Word of God first in your life, you'll have something to sing about. Spontaneously, you'll find yourself singing God's Word and turning statutes into songs. When your heart delights in God's law, your lips must declare God's praise. After all, you talk about the things that you love. When God's word fills your heart, the right words will come out of your mouth. Psalm 119, verses 153 through 176. Look down upon my sorrows and rescue me. For I have not forgotten your, the Lord's law. Argue my case, take my side. Protect my life as you promised. The wicked are far from salvation, but they do not bother with your principles. Lord, how great is your mercy! In your justice, give me back my life. Many persecute and trouble me. Yet I have not swerved from your decrees. I hate these traitors, because they care nothing for your word. See how I love your commandments, Lord. Give back my life because of your unfailing love. All your words are true. All your just laws will stand forever. Powerful people harass me without cause, but my heart trembles only at your word. I rejoice in your word like one who finds a great treasure. I hate and abhor all falsehood, but I love your law. 
I will praise you seven times a day, because all your laws are just. Those who love your law have great peace and do not stumble. I long for your salvation, Lord, so I have obeyed your commands. I have obeyed your decrees, and I love them very much. Yes, I obey your commandments and decrees, because you know everything I do. O oh Lord, listen to my cry. Give me the discerning mind you promised. Listen to my prayer. Rescue me as you promised. Let my lips burst forth with praise, for you have taught me your principles. Let my tongue sing about your word, for all your commands are right. Stand ready to help me, for I have chosen to follow your commandments. O oh Lord, I have longed for your salvation, and your law is my delight. Let me live so I can praise you, and may your laws sustain me. I have wandered away like a lost sheep. Come and find me, for I have not forgotten your commands. Proverbs 28, verses 23 and 24. In the end, people appreciate frankness more than flattery. Robbing your parents and then saying, What's wrong with that? is as serious as committing murder.